My name Christian Thomas, Marine, and why I joined Marines, I wanted a challenge. Not just physical challenge, I wanted a mental challenge. I always thrived on physical, but also the mental. Marines was the only one that gave me the opportunity to challenge myself, both spiritually, physically, and mentally. So I joined. Not only did I join, I joined the hardest side, which is infantry. Infantry is the door kickers, ground pounders, the ones that look for the enemy. And I love that. I wanted that challenge. That warrior's mentality. I thrived off that. So when I picked infantry, and being the age I was, joining at 24, people looked at me differently too. Like, why did you join so late in years? Why not? Better late than never. So I joined infantry, went to boot camp, went to school of infantry, graduated first in my class infantry, was meritorious promoted in the school of infantry. I was the oldest person in my company, my platoon, and the battalion, besides the officers, the major and the sergeant major, I was the oldest one. I had something to prove, mentally. I was pushed. Physically, I was pushed even harder. Climbing mountains, carrying heavy packs. I did it all. Stayed up late, studying, to be the best I can possibly be. Got my unit number, and was moved on to 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines after I graduated school infantry. When they say 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, worldwide, we have a, a stigma of being warriors, true warriors, all the way from Way City, Vietnam, Korea, World War I and II, Bella Wood, the Frozen Chosen, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines have a reputation for being true warriors. The Fallujah War in Iraq. And when my chance got, when I got an opportunity to go to Afghanistan, I took it. We went to the hardest place you can possibly go. Sang in Afghanistan. Very few people even heard of Derby's uh, Sang in Afghanistan. But when you look it up, in your history books, it's a mean place. When 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines got the mission to go to Sangin and uh, replace 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, and 40 Commando of the Royal Marines, we knew that we were going to be in for a tough fight. Uh, and we were going to be taking over the area of operations by ourselves. Uh, the mission that we were given from 1st Marine Division forward was to conduct full-scale counterinsurgency operations in Sangin District in order to expand governance, uh, security, and economic development. The expectations coming in were that this was going to be a tough fight. Uh, the British had been here for four years. Uh, they had suffered over 106 dead uh, here in Sangin District. So, like I said, we, we knew that this was going to be a tough fight. We get there, and what the most welcoming place I've ever been to. My first op, even getting there, we got shot at by an RPG. Not one, but two. That was my welcome to Sangin story right there. Saying, looking at all the young guys, 18, 19 years old, fresh out of high school, and I'm 24, 25 years old, they looking at me like, what now? This is what we joined for, it's infantry. And I look back at the whole challenge of, of staying up late, studying, looking at different weapons, and training different people in the Marine Corps. I love that the aspect of leading Marines, leading people, and challenge myself that if I could actually do it. I did, and I was real good at it. I always enjoyed mentoring young guys, not just a job of infantry, but as a, being a man, being a leader, being who you are, learning who you are. Because Lord knows I've been through my struggles going up and going through my situation of being an older person. They always call me the old man of the, of the, of the squad, the old man of the platoon. At first, 
I didn't like it, but after a while, I began to like it. My first tour in 08, 2008, I was assigned to 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines to, that was Fresh Eye Boot Camp, Fresh Eye SOI, School of Infantry. My first go around, scared, terrified. Yeah, that was just a few words I had my first go around. So I'll, at first, I was scared. It's that more of a nervous excitement. I'm looking toward like, get my chance to actually serve my country and, and do my job and get the excitement to go, I was happy. So the process of uh, preparing, training, um, just getting mentally and physically prepared, immensely prepared to go to war for the first time. Me, my squad, like I said, me being the oldest person, a lot of people looked up to me. I never been in combat. I looked on my squad leader as my first tour was a 21 year old guy from Minnesota. Man, I'm the guy, oldest guy, but I'm looking toward the youngest guy of my squad to lead me into battle. My trust was all in him. A 21 year old to lead a bunch of 13, 13 Marines into combat for our first tour, his second. He did multiple tours in Iraq. And this is the first go around in Afghanistan. For a 21 year old to lead a bunch of Marines that never been green, uh, green guys to go to a combat zone was very scary. So the whole evolution of training, it was a nine month workup to go on a seven month deployment. Nine month workup. So when you look toward a, nine, a 21 year old to lead you into combat, and to get an actual shot to serve our country and look for bad guys and do what we join the Marine Corps do. It was scary. Our first night, our first op, just waiting on, just getting that excitement, nervous excitement, to getting our mission order, getting the, just getting our, uh, letting our lieutenant, our captain talk to us, get motivate us, get psych us out, you know, just to get us pumped up and ready to go on our first patrol, our first op, and to get that word like, oh, we about to go. It's just exciting, like going to go look for our job. So our squad leader talked to us, we pray. And then usually the one, I was the one that prayed because I was the, the most religious person. And a lot of people looked up to me in that aspect of being a religious leader. So I always prayed, not just for our squad, but our platoon, even our company. So now our chaplain all the, time, all the time was there to help us, but I helped us prepare us spiritually for the people is to just to get ready for combat, just pray for our safety, pray for guidance, and we do the right thing and, and, and protect our families back in the state. So um, I always leave them to prayer, and my 21 year old sergeant make sure we got all our, uh, our guns clean, ammo, food, water, uh, the right stuff we need to accomplish a mission. Make sure you got the maps, uh, coordinate with uh, different assets, machine guns. Um, air support, just get that first go around, it's that first jitter. And as we prepare to walk out the wire, open that gate in the wire, and you, and you just walk out and see the world. It's a different ball game, it's not training. It's just opening the world and it's like, as soon as you step in that wire, the enemy knows you're coming. They watching you from secret locations all over. And just the excitement and also being scared at the same time that people are looking at you right now through a scope, through bin uh, to binoculars, everything. You got scouts looking at you, looking at your every step. It's scary. And I think about my first firefight, walking, I think it was our first firefight, was that same day. It was a little bit after we stepped off, like six in the morning, and just walking down the street, walking down a, a you would think it, it's the middle of the street, and people walk around, um, kids playing and just people walking around a little market and they see you no know, gunfire just rang out from the side. They try to ambush us as we go up a hill going to going from the city to like the desert area. That first firefight and just seeing rounds just hit the ground as you walk and not just yourself but your squad mates rounds is hitting you and then next thing you know like you try to take cover. There ain't much cover in the desert so you gotta pray they got the best of shots. And I just remember myself as things start slowing down to like very, very slow. You see rounds slowly hitting the ground. You seeing guys in the background screaming, screaming, or yelling out commands. You can't hear them 
because your mind is so tunnel vision on your safety. Make sure your guys are safety and make sure you return fire and go back to training. Because once you snap and like realize like, hey, stop being scared. This is big boy rules. This is war. I don't want to say you get used to being in firefights, but it's just that adrenaline rush. And me being the oldest, but also just a regular guy, GP, general population guy, I didn't have no real responsibility. So I, I wasn't in charge of nobody in my first deployment. So just to get the opportunity to do it, um, I trained, 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 and, and just to get as much knowledge I could from my 21-year-old uh, squad leader. He used to help me out, different stuff, from different techniques on what he was taught, and he's a junior Marine. So I used to always talk to him and just get, uh, get different uh, points from him, his knowledge, uh, his experience. And as deployment went on, he allowed me to be from going from GP to team leader and just removing up that, that structural rank inside the squad to be a better leader, showing me how to lead Marines in combat. And just going through the whole process, uh, we didn't receive that much uh, a bad, uh, I won't say bad time, but it, it wasn't as bad as, you know, as we thought it was, you know, cause we had a few firefights here and of course a few IEDs, but it wasn't like the Iraq war that people would say, oh my God, you're going to get up like a thousand gunfights. They're going to see insurgents and Taliban all over the place. We've seen it, but it wasn't as prevalent in Afghanistan. Afghanistan, like they like ghosts. Cause they just blend in, they shoot, and they just blend in with the population. It's mind, it's mind blowing because they can shoot at you, drop their weapons, and just blend in, and you can't shoot them. Because they're ROEs. Our rules of engagement was that we had to have personal identification that they have a weapon and they are a threat to us. If they drop their weapon after they shoot at us, we are no longer to shoot at them or to eliminate them. So just getting that whole mindset of training yourself like you can't shoot a civilian or you can't shoot a farmer because he looks like he has a gun. You have to know with your eyes and see that he has a weapon on. Now, that's me, that to me sounds like you taking us, sending us to war while our hands are tied behind our back, which a lot of times it felt like it, but I understand the process, you want collateral damage. So that whole deployment, um, we only lost one person. Um, he got shot. Um, we had, I think, six wounded, but that was my first deployment from 08 to the beginning of uh, 09. Uh, that was my first time and it was on from there. I craved it, I, I wanted more. Uh, it's just that rush, and nothing like a general rush of getting in a firefight. Not just you, but you and your boys. You train this long, long time, this whole deployment to do your job. And when you actually do your job, it's fun. But the good and bad of war, you get both. You sign up to do that job, you get both sides. And going from that, going to different, uh, we get back to the states on that, and I wanted to be in that leadership role. I wanted it bad. So um, my leadership sent me to different schools, um, from Squalia's course and um, different kind of courses to hone my skills as a leader uh, so I can lead Marines, so I can better lead my Marines in the combat, and not just in combat, in in garrison too, back at home, how to conduct themselves as men, Marines off and on, uh, out of the barracks when they are at home, you know, with their wives and kids. So uh, I crave that. And when it's my turn to shine on my second tour, to get the order, like Corporal Thomas is about to lead 13 Marines in the combat. We get the order, we go into Sangin, Afghanistan. Like I said, Saying in Afghanistan, nobody never heard of it. So when I Google it, I heard nothing but bad things about it from the British, because the British Royal Marines, their special forces were there from 2006 to 2010. And we get there, it was another battalion there, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, so they was there for a little bit, but British Marines were there. But when we get there, our first day in there, like I said, we got shot from an RPG. 
and just to just to see like this ain't this is real and they shooting at us and everything getting contact from the moment we leave the bird and we gotta try and find safety so once we realize like hey this is a real deal and I'm a leader and you got young guys looking up to me it's like I looked up to my guy my squad leader looking up to him so as we prepare ourselves get our packs off the bird as we rush into our home our uh, our our base to collect ourselves you know get uh, uh, further instructions on how we're going to conduct uh, operations in Afghanistan um, we get our packs unload them and we get word that we got a follow-on mission the next day night op night op is one of the worst and scariest things you possibly go through uh, night ops when you actually go in the uh, middle of the night where the enemy is supposed to be sleeping but we go into a room to do raids or do ambush ambush missions at night set in into defense and wait for them bait the enemy in to where they think you are and you ambush them as they try to attack you you ambush them at night and the cover up conceal them and cover and conceal so that was my mission I was tasked with leading my Marines having attachments machine guns mortars uh, a two-man sniper team to assist us in our first night op and my, I remember the first thing I was thinking at night uh, that daytime after I got my orders to, as I prepare myself and prepare my guys to do our first night op I can just thinking like this is my first time leading guys in combat and this is my time to shine. I was scared. I just bowed down like ask God to just lead me and guide me in the direction I would keep these guys safe. And nothing happened to them. Cause that was the scariest thing to me because to lose the Marines under your charge is probably the worst thing that could possibly happen. Cause there ain't no Call of Duty, no, and it's, it's not Call of Duty, it's no reset button. They're, well, if they're, they're dead, they're dead. And once you get that feeling like, that's not good. So as we prepare for our night op, I check my guys, look them in their eyes, make sure they're mentally and physically ready. Talk to them, make sure they got everything, make sure they're not forgetting nothing. Weapon systems check, make sure they have everything. Uh, night vision goggles, thermal vision, make sure everybody is good to go, radio checks. And as we get ready for our first uh, night off, we leave the compound, leave our base. We get chatter from our interpreter, our Afghan interpreter, that we are being watched. Uh, when you hear that feeling at night, you think, how are they able to see us? It's nighttime. How are they able to see us? Um, it's kind of scary, like you being watched, but you looking for them and you go into your first house. You go into your first house. I can remember my, I told my demolition guy to set up a few wall charges to, to not go to the door, but go to the side of the house. Now, when he, as he put the, the um, C4, uh, the wall charge on the wall to blow up the wall so we can go through it, um, it was a dog barking, which pretty much gave away our position. And automatically right there, we got shot at from the front and the, the west side of us. So it was pretty much our weak side because we had most of our machine guns stagnant and it was like uh, off, off center a little bit. So it was mostly to the right. So we was walking in range of foul, but as we broke apart to you know go into the compound at the night raid, um, it, it, it kind of went to crap on us because um, we got shot at and people started getting scared and running. And you can't just run and sing in Afghanistan because it's uh, landmines, IDs laced all over this place, all, all on the ground. So you gotta be careful when you're walking. So as we getting shot at, at the same time, one of my junior Marines, uh, one of my junior Marines kind of stepped out of place and um, explosion hit and it was secondary too. So as he stepped on the first ID going to the wall, as he tried to take cover, it was an IED waiting for him. So as the explosion happened, everybody's completely shocked, dust and dirt going everywhere. It's the chaos of explosion getting shot at. And people 
trying to like look for help. What, what are we gonna do now? Look what we're gonna do now and start shooting. It's a scary feeling. And it, it's, try, it's hard to say, but you, you try to like calm yourself in that situation where you're going through so much hell. I'm talking about you getting shot at, you gotta worry about uh, taking care of this guy who just may have lost both his legs and ID, secondary going off. Luckily nobody was near the secondary because it was just off to the right of the first one. Uh, so we got to worry about calling a, a Medi medivac bird, calling a, a air support to help suppress the enemy and find out where they at and, and try to help us eliminate this target. So I'm on the bird calling, I'm on the company uh, uh, radio trying to get a hold of uh, the medivac. And they tell me it's too much gunfire going on so they can't come in. And that's one of the worst news you could possibly hear. Like you got this guy is bleeding to death from his legs being pretty much blown off. And a bird tell me that they can't come in, it's too much uh, heavy fire. So that tells me that you don't want to help another Marine because he's bleeding to death. So I help my, uh, I'm myself, my doc, and my other junior Marines helping me put tourniquets on my buddy's legs to help stop the bleeding and keep him calm so he won't fall asleep. Because you fall asleep, you go by and go in shock and you can just die off that, off for sure shock. And we try to stop his bleeding, calm him down so his blood don't start just rushing, rushing, rushing and he loses a lot of blood. So we try to calm him down so he can, you know, not fall asleep, keep him awake, keep him in, uh, awake so he can help us out. and. I got my support team to help me out to, you know, repel the enemy fire. So while we get shot at, we're shooting and moving, like trying to get him to safety, and we're moving from uh, our point of attack, and we're going to safety. Is like make sure that he is okay, and try to get a secondary bird to come in. So I just remember that whole first night that I had to deal with not just enemy fire, but explosion, uh, calling a bird, try to eliminate the threat. Um, we, that was a part of a two hour ordeal. Um, that was my first, my first time as a leader, leading Marines. That was my first, uh, first, pretty much my first patrol leading and losing uh, my guys, losing his legs on his first time, his first combat deployment. And my first time leading Marines. So that, that kind of hurt a little bit. That, 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 that really did hurt. Um, that kind of made me question myself a little bit. Uh, can I do it? Because um, it's not made for everybody. Not everybody can lead Marines, and especially in the combat. Um, so I kind of doubted myself a little bit. And um, I, I talked to a couple other guys, my peer group, or a couple leadership guys to you know, help me out with that. Um, that I was the right man for the job, but it's kind of hard to to go through that and like what you could have done different. And I think about that even to this day, but at the time I did question, but this is combat. You can't cry with spoiled milk. You have to go on, you have to move on, learn from that mistake, which I did. And, but it, it did hurt, it did hurt. So um, going from that, um, and just watching how our deployment that deployment was bad on, not just on our side, but we lost to quite a bit of people. Like our first battalion wide, our first three days, we lost six guys, 13, uh, mostly from IEDs, six guys, uh, four in a um, uh, MRAP, which is our big mine vehicle, an IED explosion. It was a 200 pound um, IED, which killed four guys. Uh, sons, dads, um, brothers, um, good friends, um, and just going through the ordeal, it was like every single day, every single day, it was something. You knew somebody who lost a leg, who got shot. I don't want to see you get numb to the fact that you got to go through that, and um, just going through the whole process of all our firefights, all the enemy uh, enemy KIA we uh, we eliminated but the fact that we was getting hit so much like we took a we took so much so much flack because we was going to war with our hands were tied behind our back you can't fight a war like that 
And when you get leadership, I'm talking about like Pentagon leadership, telling you your leadership to bring your battalion out of Afghanistan because we're receiving too many casualties. Over three months, we already had 19 KIA killed in action and already over 100 wounded in action. Most have been blown up, uh, double amputees, triple amputees, uh, getting shot. Uh, we took a lot of casualties. And when you got just one battalion taking over a whole area of operations, taking over from two battalions, uh, that's a lot of ground to cover. And we, we, was, we, was getting, we was getting defeated. Mentally and physically, we were getting defeated because we was fighting a war with our hands, hands are tied behind our back and trying to fight the enemy who are like ghosts. Because you rarely see them, but when you see them, they can easily shoot at you and just blend in with the population because they know we have to have positive identification to, to engage them. So um, that, was a hard, that was a hard feat. Um, it's going through different patrols uh, from being mounted, walking foot patrols to vehicle patrols we 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 was uh we was getting it on both ends so um i think i, I think the tire the, the tide turned when winter time hit because winter time was like the first in history where the u.s in the afghanistan history where we actually go hunting for them in the winter time because winter time is when the Af when the taliban guys go pretty much go on vacation they regroup re get more guys, uh, money start getting pumped in to get more weapons, explosions, you know, it's more, it's better for them because they go hiding, you know, get more guys, start training. And what we did was the first time in Afghanistan history since 2001 that we did, we went on the offensive. Most companies, most battalions, most regiments go on sleep mode during the winter time, not their battalion, 5th Marines. We are aggressive. We did, got tanks for the first time in Afghanistan history. We used the tanks, and we was more the aggressor instead of the, uh, the, the wait and see attitude. We had a more aggressive attitude where we actually go hunt you down and find you. And that either by capture or kill. So when we went on aggressive in on the December, November, December, January time frame was cold, but we still attack, attack, attack. Every single day, every single night, that's when we, we, the, we start winning our side. And it got so bad at one time on their side that their leadership, the Taliban leadership, asked for a ceasefire. And most times you never hear that in a ceasefire for, because they were receiving too many hits or too many casualties on their side, which is like most, almost unheard of for the enemy to ask for a timeout, a timeout in war. Are you kidding me? So, in good faith, uh, for the elders, village elders, and the Taliban uh, people, they kind of agreed on uh, a truce or a ceasefire, which to help the Afghanistan uh, population out and the uh, actual good guys, the few good guys they did have, we let, let them have their, their ceasefire so they can regroup or build their buildings back up or uh, you know, just help the, the, the locals out so that we won't have any more destruction on their side. So it was a two week ceasefire and after those two weeks, it was on. We went at them like a like a like a unleashed pit bull again, using tanks and different kind of methods of trying to seek and define, seek and find and destroy the enemy. So after that whole process, we was winning. So after that whole seven to eight months in Afghanistan, um, we had over 520 firefights, but on the bad side, we also had 25 kill in action and almost 230 wounded in action, mostly uh, loss of limbs because of IEDs. Um, that was a, one of the most, uh, the hardest um, deployments in Marine Corps history uh, for that war. Um, no other unit in Marine Corps history has ever suffered any more casualties than we did. 
That's not a record you want because it's guys that I knew that I looked up to and we 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 never got back. So um um I think about that a lot because we lost a lot of guys and a lot of them were first time dads, um, first time husbands and when you, when you know the family, cause we was all a, a tight knit group because in infantry we all brothers. No matter if they're white, black, Hispanic, or no, it doesn't matter. We all, we all, we all brothers. And when you see a, a loved one, or you see a brother that you just been fighting alongside, I mean, you see them getting carried off in a plastic bag or uh, pushed away in a, in, a, in, a, in a helicopter, that's the most hardest thing in the world. Like, you ask yourself, you question yourself, what I could have done better or why him? And I, I looked at that because I was the only single guy, only no kids. Everybody in my squad, mostly everybody in my platoon, all was married or either had kids or uh, a, 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 a strong relationship with a girlfriend. And I always ask myself, why? Why, why them? Why those guys? They never got a chance to hold their kid, they never got a chance to see their wives again. Um, and I, I always question myself, like, even when I was in a situation where I thought I should have been dead, situations where I know I should have been dead, and I question, not God, but I question the situation, like, if why couldn't it, like if it was me, if I would lost my leg or whatever, it, it hurts this day because maybe I wasn't, God knew that I wasn't mentally strong enough and they are because a lot of those guys are still doing full lives even with no limbs, um, going through life even more adventurous than they did before they joined the Marine Corps skiing, um, jumping from planes, jump, um, uh, all kind of different stuff. Um, it, 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 it worries me a lot, like that survivor's guilt, like why them, why they have to go. Um, um, it's, it's hard. Um, like I said, my own situation where, where I was walking, walking my squad and all of a sudden a 15 year old scout from that from the Taliban wants to kill us and just so happened that me and my squad was walking down a, a alleyway and he decided to hit a command wire where he put two wires together and they explode and seven ID well five IDs out of seven go off and um, luckily the one that actually affected me was buried a little bit too deep in the ground and the one in front of me and the one behind me didn't go off. So the one that was too deep in the ground, all the different mechanisms, all the shrapnel did not hit me. And I realized at that moment, I was like, I do have a purpose. I do have a reason to even be here. Why question myself? Why question God to allow me to live? Because I think he allowed me to live so I can tell my story, my way, because it's a lot of guys whose story will never be told because we not like talk about it. A lot of times we don't talk about it, but their tomorrow allow me to live my today. They sacrifice themselves so I can sit here and see my family and I enjoy every second of it. Every single fresh air, every single, just the freedom to walk around my city, my state to drive around, go to the mall, go to the movies, go eat my fresh, my favorite restaurants. That's, they allow me to, to have that, that freedom because they paid the ultimate sacrifice 
for their lives. And at the time I didn't see that because I was worried about myself, like why me, why me? So now I know why me because it's the media tell their story on their behalf and tell my side because I was had the, I don't say the best and the worst seat in the house. Well, I met some of the best guys that ever walked this planet. The best guys, young guys, 18 to 23. Some of the best and brightest people I've ever met in my life. Uh, not a lot of times they, uh, we all got along, but it's like family, you, everybody in family don't get along, so. But it was some of the best guys I ever met in my life. And just knowing those guys, I'm a better person because of that. And I still keep in contact with their wives, their kids. Um, try to call them uh, so we can keep that same type brotherhood that we had while we was on deployment and just leaving uh, that whole Marine Corps lifestyle that it was us against the world pretty much because we had that same type mentality like if I save you you gonna save me it's that whole brotherhood like I got your back we always say well, I got your six and that's I got your back you got mine so we always had that mentality us against the world and just finishing up that deployment was like, I could just remember leaving that bird, the last, the last plane ride out, and just coming home, like knowing that I'm coming back to the States to breathe American air, to eat American food, to see American people. That was the happiest moment of my life right now. That, to this day, is the happiest moment of my life, just knowing that it's not people out there trying to kill me on a regular day basis. Not, not too many people can experience that. And because it's a different type of adrenaline rush when you know that people are trying to kill you and to people try to, you know, try to help you out. So leaving, leaving Afghanistan for the last time, I cried my eyes out because it's because of that situation where I lost a lot of friends who would never be able to walk their door down the aisle or uh, dance with their uh, kids at their kids' wedding, or to see their son go off to college, play college ball or whatever, play basketball, and be able to watch their wives in the kitchen washing dishes or cooking, or just uh, talking to the kids, or say bedtime stories. It's, it's men that will never see that chance. So I live every single day of my life without complaining, because I can't complain about going to work. I can't complain about my leg pain or my head hurt, my back hurt because their yesterday is my today. They gave their lives so I can live my single life without any complaints. To cherish the every single second of my life for the rest of my life. So I keep my two best friends that I had on deployment with me, uh, my guy, Lieutenant uh, uh, Lance Corporal Corzine, who died on December 24th, Christmas Eve, 2010. And I keep um, Sergeant Morris with me, who died on January 20th, 2011. He had three kids, and I live every single single day living for him because he one gave me the, the pretty much like the push to be a better person, be, to be a better Marine, to, to actually enjoy life, have fun with it, not just be so serious all the time. So he the one gave me that opportunity to do that. He the one pushed that that drive to to be actually like to like guns, because I never really been a, a big but gun guy until I met Sergeant Morris. And I appreciate uh, Lance Corporal Corzine because we had good times because I taught him how to play dominoes, but I never figured out how he always beat me, and I taught him. So we always had a little funny little joke about that, how um, I taught him different things, and you know, we, I, we laugh about it, too, but uh, I, I say I live every single day for those two guys, and they're they the reason why I'm here. I thank God for them being in my life, and I cherish them. I keep these two KIA bracelets with me every single day to remind me I'm living for them, their kids, their future. And I, I can't complain about nothing. I can't complain about anything at all. Because when you've been at the bottom, when you had to fight for life, when you had to fight to survive every single day, you cherish the small things. And right now, I cherish the small things. Any kind of traffic, um, 
I cherish all that. I, tra I cherish going, to, waiting in line to go to the movies. I cherish spending time with my niece and nephew. I spent uh, my family. Just, just being able to the freedom to walk, drive around my, my truck and go to the mall, go wherever I want because it's good men who died for my freedom to walk around and not just myself, but fellow uh, civilians in the United States to walk around every single day that they'll never know the pain we go through just to protect them because there's good men out there, good women out there who are willing to die for them to have a good life, to have to have opportunity to get on Facebook, to get on, go to the mall, go shopping, go get shoes, go, go get shoes or whatever. There's good men and good women out there who will sacrifice themselves so you can have a better day. So I trash that every single day of my life and that's how I go on. That's my life um, as, a, as a Marine. I enjoyed it and I never take it back.